Okay, the prophecy of Habakkuk then comes from the early 600s BC. And Habakkuk's big concern, really, he bursts on the scene with this huge concern, the injustice of it all. No, we know about that, don't we? We can look out on our world and we can see things that we look at and we think, Lord, just do something about this. Injustice, violence, and it affects him. He feels it. And he cries out to God. Now, <clears throat> Habakkuk is an Old Testament prophet. And we don't know much about him. We don't know much about him at all. Very little. He's, he's just a voice for God. That's what we know. It's all sorts of speculation, but that's what it is. All we know is this guy is there speaking to God, but the way it goes is there's like this big dramatic dialogue that goes on. It's like literature teaching us stuff. It's very good, well, very good. It's very hard, Hebrew, right? Uh, it's, it's structured and it's put to, it's very clever, carefully done stuff. But there's like this dialogue going on between Habakkuk and God, and out of it we're learning things about how to deal with the world we live in, and the, the life we face. You see. We don't know the extent of Habakkuk's experience of the Spirit of God. What we do know is this. Jeremiah, who's a fairly, pretty much a contemporary of, of Habakkuk, writing about the same times, he talks about what will happen when God breaks into all this mess that we have to contend with. And he says, God says, through Jeremiah, I will put I'll, I'll, I'll put a new spirit with you. I'll give you a heart, a heart of flesh. You're going to have a new heart. And the blessing of the new covenant is that your old heart of stone is going to be dealt with and you're going to have a heart transplant and you're going to be given a heart of flesh. A heart that's going to feel in ways that it didn't before. It's going to be sensitive to God and it's going to be sensitive to the world that you're in. And, and we see this when people are converted. Use an old-fashioned word there, but you know what I mean, don't you? When people become Christians, right? When they're converted, when they're turned round, what's converted is their heart, and you're given a new heart. And that heart is going to be sensitive to things happening. Sensitive to God, sensitive to things happening in the world. And you're going to say, like Habakkuk from time to time, Lord, why? How long? Now, it's not such an irrelevance to us, this book, is it? Habakkuk looks out on his world, his world, his people, his time, his government and its institutions, and he sees it falling far short of God's ideal for society and for the people of God, and he complains to God. Just as many of us see things happening in our world or in our country. And we want to turn to God and we want to shout, foul! So does Habakkuk. But he does it within the spirit of prophecy and the presence of his God. And there's something to learn there. If you're going to cry, do it on your knees. The best possible place to do it. If you're coming apart, do it in the presence of God, in the presence of God's people. Habakkuk can teach us a lot just from the outset. Here's how it goes. Here's how the book goes. And it's like in two panels. It's like two things happening. Here's the dramatic dialogue. You see how I've tried to give you a little diagram with it on? Do my best. It's on a sort of a papyrus background. Do you see that? A nice little note. Well, I'm just pointing it out in case you didn't see it. There it is. Habakkuk's first complaint. There's the first thing. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. And then chapter 1, 5 to 11, God responds to that. And then what happens then? Chapter 1, verse 12 to chapter 2, verse 1. Habakkuk makes his second complaint. He says, what? Okay. And he goes again. And God makes a longer response. Quite a lot longer. <laughs> And by the time Habakkuk has met with God in this dialogue, this back and forth, not on the basis of any reason and rational <coughs> explanation, but on the basis of having met with God in this, God heard him, God heard his complaint, God dealt with him, told him his own heart and what he's going to have to do on the basis of that trans transformed Habakkuk. 
a transformed man, having met with that God, worships in awe and wonder the God who does things we don't understand. Okay? Have a good in a nutshell. Firstly then, we're looking today at Habakkuk's first complaint and God's first response to it. Trust me, we may not get far into that first response of God, okay? Because I know you like to eat and it'll be dinner time. And, you, know, you can't preach over rumbling tummies, you just can't do it. It's not, on. It's not babies that are the problem, it's rumbling tummies in church elders. So here we're looking at Habakkuk's first complaint and God's first response, but mainly we're not going to get as far as much to do with the complaint today. And their response to them. Here's how it starts out then. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1. The NIV sets out with this phrase the prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. So, obviously, first off, there's a prophet, he's called Habakkuk, and God's told him something. Right? All you're getting now is coming from God. It's going to be this dramatic construct, it's going to be a, a different way of communicating to what we're used to. It's going to be a, a story, a, a thing. You know, I, I'm working itself. It's going to communicate God's truth to us. But don't be under any, under any illusions, says the Lord through the prophet. This is a prophecy. God is speaking here. And, and this, is, this is what he's delivering. Um, it, it says prophecy, but actually the word is massah. It means a burden. This is the burden of Habakkuk, the prophet. You see? This is going to be a heavy load to bear. I've got to tell you this. It's going to be a weight on my shoulders. Habakkuk's ministry is intensely blessed by God. But it is not some blessing drenched walk in the park. Difficult times. Bring difficult times for the people of God. Carrying a load. And I worry sometimes a bit about preachers who seem to lack any sense of constraint like this, like the one that Habakkuk's talking about. I got this burden, he says, I've got to, I've got to get this across. There's a constraint. God has called Habakkuk to serve in a time of radical spiritual decline, when the people of God have abandoned the faith. Not their reputation for having faith, but they've abandoned God with the consequences that follow for for. Justice and righteousness and, and peace, predictable consequences, but now we're having to carry them. And God has given Habakkuk a difficult task, a heavy load, a difficult thing to convey in that time. He doesn't, doesn't give Habakkuk an inoffensive message. Quite the reverse. He doesn't give Habakkuk a, a cool ministry. I don't think he gave him a worship band. I can have a worship band. Habakkuk carries a heavy load. His ministry is that load and this prophecy is a big part of it. Please notice this. God sometimes calls faithful people to serve him through horrible days and has nothing to convey to them but the judgment that is coming. And they're going to feel it. And their ministry is no less blessed, anointed, called or sent by God. Jeremiah at the same time. Jeremiah goes off into exile. Look, the exiles to Babylon. Can you imagine? What a tremendously empowered prophet. It makes those people absolutely no less faithful or worthy to find themselves in that position. No less blessed by God. Habakkuk certainly isn't called to a popular sort of ministry. Well, when did all this happen? What's going on? There you are, I thought I'd put a picture on the wall for you. That is an ancient cuneiform text referring to Jehoiakim's rational allowance in Babylonian captivity. What? Yes. Uh, Jehoiakim the king, right? He's the one who's the last in the line of these bad kings doing all these bad things of which Habakkuk is complaining. And that's an actual lump of rock from Babylon which talks about the rations he was given in prison in Babylon. And we've got a real one. How exciting is that? I can see it all really thrilled. Oh, I'm disappointed. Because I thought that was amazing. Can you say what's the In Babylon, Jehoiakim, who is the punishment is coming, right? The judgment is coming. And Jehoiakim the king is going to be wrapped up in that and taken off to Babylon for all his badness. And he'll be a prisoner in Babylon. 
Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim is going to be a prisoner in Babylon because of all that's being said here in Habakkuk. And that there is an account in stone of what they fed him in prison when he was there. Jehoiakim. Yes, yeah, not Habakkuk. Jehoiakim. What he? I am so telling you. It's okay for you to stop me and check up on me, especially today. Because I'm really tired. I've been up to bear in Habakkuk for you. Okay. So, the historical circumstance is what's going on between 609 and 605 BC fit pretty precisely with what Habakkuk is talking about. King, now you've got to watch this, you're not going to find this bit easy. Because there are two kings here, Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim. Got that? Right. I know. It should be called Fred Nerbert, but they're not. We've got Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim. Now Jehoiakim was the first one. And he'd taken everybody back to the practices of bad King Manasseh. Do you remember bad King Manasseh from Sunday school? Black Manasseh, in the words of the Welsh hymn, right? So, yeah, he's a bad boy. And he's led the people off into these bits of idolatry. After him, a little way down the line, has come Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim is the one who's taken all these people in, in Judah back into all those dark practices <coughs> and the violence and so on that prevails in the land of what Habakkuk's now going on about complaining about to God. Now what's going to happen is that God is going to actually hear Habakkuk's prayer and he's going to respond to all this rebellion by judging the people. And the king of Babylon is going to come and as he's on his way Jehoiakim is going to die. I don't know if he died of fright, but he died. And Jehoiakim takes over. Jehoiakim ends up practically being the last in the Davidic kings of Judah. This is it. This is curtains. Mm -hmm. Curtains on the monarchy. And Jehoiakim, the second one there, see? In those days, he's defeated in 597 BC and he's carried off captive to Babylon and that's his ration sheet. We have one. It's in Berlin, apparently. Calamity is coming on the people of God for the de facto abandonment of him. And in such a crisis as that, Habakkuk declares essentially one way to cope with living in those days for God's people. Habakkuk 2 4 says this. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by faith. In days like that, here's the key, says Habakkuk. The righteous will live by faith, and a very good alternative translation would be faithfulness. Faith is not separated from faithfulness. The throne of David would remain vacant for 600 years until great David's greatest son arrived. You know his name, we're talking about Jesus. The monarchy has collapsed finally the way God said it would. But there are difficult days to go through as a result of all of that. So exactly what's going on in Judah that Habakkuk complains so bitterly against? Here it is. Habakkuk's complaint, verses 2 to 4. How long, Lord, must I call for help? <clears throat> Doesn't he sound like an irate spouse? How long am I going to wait for you to do this? You know? Is the list of jobs? Right? Uh, no, my wife isn't like this at all. <laughs> That's why we will both be eating lunch still, I hope. Right? <laughs> but, you know, you've heard language like this before. How long am I going to put up with this from you? How long am I going to... Habakkuk is being quite bold. He's, he's come to a pretty high tension, isn't he? Mm. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Can you talk to God like that? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? 
Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There's strife, conflict abounds. And, and look, look, look what else? Look what else comes along. Therefore, the law is paralyzed. Look, your law is paralyzed. And justice never prevails. The wicked head in the righteous, so that justice is perverted. So many of our Christian brethren live today in countries under circumstances where justice doesn't prevail. There are courts. It's not justice that happens. It's the law of the rich or the powerful that prevails. And Habakkuk is crying out about that going on all the time. Now, interestingly enough, he speaks up as one person. He speaks up as a sing in the singular as one person, a plaintiff, as it were, in court, addressing God's court with a complaint. But God responds to a plurality of people. Whether it's the assembly of the righteous, either members of the heavenly court, or those who are crowding its public gallery, people on earth who say, more, oh, 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 come on. The first big thing he's got to say, and that's his burden, is how long? How long? See, the implication of this first heading of complaints and concerns is that Habakkuk has been taking the increasing godlessness and lawlessness of his society and people to God for some time. You know what it's like to have a situation that, that you, you find is a, a weight on your shoulders and you take it to God for some long time. Habakkuk has been taking what he sees to God for some long time. We know what that's about, don't we? We know what that's about. And incidentally, it, what he's taken to God is not going to have the sort of positive outcome that Habakkuk may at first have hoped for. It looks as if Habakkuk has returned to the issue with his heart breaking to pray over the situation again and again. But how long? Hang on, we've heard that before. Well, we heard that before in the Old Testament. How many times up until now have we heard God say that? Habakkuk's picking up a phrase which... And famously, it, it becomes a phrase God uses quite a lot through his dealings with, the, with his Old Testament people. So you, you go back to um, Exodus 16, 28. There they are out in the desert, you know, and, and God says, they say, Lord, we haven't got any food, you know, give us the leeks and the garlic of Egypt kind of thing. And he says, no, I've given you this bread stuff, it's called manna, right? You go, it's there for free, pick it up, take it every day, so you will trust me every day. We don't pick it up on Sundays. What? Sabbath, you know. Don't pick it up. I'll, I'll be a bit more literal. Don't pick it up on a Sabbath. Well, what, what, what's going to happen on Sabbath? You're going to, what, no food? No breakfast? And God sees the ingratitude of the people who then go out and try and pick it up. And there's none there. And he says, how long am I going to put up with you? How long? Or oh, Numbers 14, you remember the story, the great story involves Joshua and Caleb. Uh, and uh, they go out with the spies, 12 of them and there's 10 others. Joshua, Caleb, faithful, strong men of God. And they survey the scene and they see that the land is, like God said, it's a land flowing with milk and honey and it's fruitful and whatever. And the 10 come back and say, oh, but they've got giants in there. And they can't trust God. And they turn the hearts of the people. They want to stone Joshua and Caleb. Caleb, oh, well, you know who it is. Right? They want to stone him. And God looks at those people and he says, you know, I've led you by the hand up until now. And how long am I going to have to plug with you? How long? It's the cry of God's heart. And do you know that doesn't end with the Old Testament? Because there's Jesus in Matthew 17. And by then, the disciples have been kicking around with Jesus for quite a long time. They, they know what he can do. They know how reliable it is. And in fact, this Matthew 17 is just after the transfiguration. They've just seen Jesus shining with heavenly glory. It's a time to trust him, isn't it? You would have thought. But somebody comes along, kneels before Jesus and says, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures. He's suffering greatly. He often falls in the fire into the water. I brought him to your disciples. They could not heal him. The man is desperate. 
And Jesus turns to them, he says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me, and he rebuked the demon, he came out of the boy, he was healed at that moment. How long, says Jesus, am I going to put up with a duff bunch of disciples like you lot? You know, we're crying to God very often, how long? And he looks at us and you think, how long has he put up with me? And then Revelation 6.10. Anybody been reading Revelation recently? No. It's a challenging book. There are the souls under the altar in Revelation 6. They're the ones who've lost their lives because of their faith and because of the testimony of Jesus that they bore. And what do they cry under the altar? How long? How long? So look. There is no doubt that the Lord himself has got a great deal of sympathy with the agonies of this prophet because the thing Habakkuk was feeling about the faithlessness of his people, those are things the Lord has previously given eloquent expression to himself and will do again. So often our prayers of perplexity find an echo in the frustrations of the Almighty. Habakkuk saying, unless I've got to sing, I'm with you, man. I'm absolutely with you on that one. How long? How long? Long unanswered prayer. He's called for justice. His prayer hasn't been answered in any form that he realises. And hang on, because that should make his little bells ring. Why has that happened? Why is it, Lord, that I've been crying about, about, out to you about the situation in the land and the, and the injustice and the government being rotten and stinking and the courts being bent and all the rest of it? Why is it I've been going on praying like this and nothing's happening? Bells should be ringing, Habakkuk, in your mind. Think back to when the monarchy was started. Think back to 1 Samuel 18. Right? And the people look round and they see that all the nations around them have got kings. Yeah? And they come along and they say, Lord, oh, to Samuel, they say, give us a king like all the other nations to lead us out in our wars and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right, fine. And he says, no, he says, God is your king. You need something you can see. You need to trust the one true suzerain, the great king, God Almighty. He fights your battles. You've seen him take you through the desert. You've seen him go in front of you like a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. You've, you've seen him. He's your God. He's your king. He leads you out in your battles. You've seen what happened with Moses and, and Amalek and all the rest of it. You, you've seen all that stuff. I remember in Sunday school. So, so you've seen all that stuff going on. And they say, oh, we want a king. And God says, okay, in the end. God says to Samuel, give him a king. Then. Give him a king and here's what's going to happen. Exactly the stuff that Habakkuk is talking about now is going to happen. God had said to them, when that day comes, and your kingdom's monarchy is broken your backs. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you've chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. How long does this have ago? It's because of that. It's because of that. So here in this verse, at the end of the sad 300 year experience with rebelliousness and monarchy, Habakkuk cries out against all that the monarch is doing to them, but the Lord does not hear. The way he said it would be back in 1 Samuel 18. And the wickedness and whatever brought in by Manasseh and his successors has sealed Israel's fate. And the answer to Habakkuk's prayers is now going to be very different from his aspirations. Most often in the Bible, God's people cry out in their distress and he hears them. That's usually our experience, isn't it? But there are hints of the sin of God's people, at least some sort of disturbance in their covenant relationship with him. May, 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 where there's reason to think so, may lead to this sort of situation of okay. So, have a good one, two. How long, Lord, must I call for help? but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. 
In fact, the answer to that is not some philosophical explanation, but only meeting with God. And thus it was also for Job. You know, there's a verse in Job 19.7 that says, Though I cry violence, I get no response. Though I call for help, there is no justice. There's a very close parallel between Job and Habakkuk here. And for Job and Habakkuk both, it is not some philosophical explanation of why. It is meeting with God that makes the difference. That makes sense, doesn't it? That makes sense, actually. What are you? What am I? <laughs> I haven't sort of had some attack of teenage angst coming at me late in life here. Who am I? Uh, it's not that. Uh, it, it's this. I am so much more than a spongy grey ball of thinking kit. Right? That thing inside your skull. I'm more than that. So the answers that I need will be more than simply what happens in that spongy grey ball, won't they? Not all the answers we seek are going to be intellectual answers because a human being is so much more than a spongy grey ball of thinking kit. And so it's going to be with Habakkuk. He's going to find his answer as he meets with God. Not in some philosophical explanation of his difficulty. Now that first time-related question is followed up by the purpose question that we do so often here in situations of difficulty from the people of God. Why? Chapter 1, verse 2, how long? Chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. We, we do sometimes hear atheists ask that question. But of course for an atheist, what's the purpose anyway? That you can't claim as a purpose if you're an atheist. Believers have a problem with that question, don't they? Why? Because we believe there's some sense and purpose out there. Why? Sometimes, from within the context of a relationship of trust, believers are justified in asking this question. We might, we might need to discover whether the Lord is leading us towards a for why that we haven't seen yet, that we need to see. Why is not necessarily a rebellious or wrong question. It could be a good question. Here's how Habakkuk puts it. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Why? Destruction and violence before me, there's strife, conflict, abounds. The law is paralysed, justice never prevails, the wicked hem, hem in the righteous, so that justice is perverted. Why? Don't tell me you haven't felt like that, because I've felt like that, and I'll feel bad. But, but we do, don't we? The objection is to being in a situation where the consequence of rebellion against God has got to be considered, has got to be recognised, has got to be acknowledged. Here's the big question. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you make me look at this? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Come on, Lord! Thunderbolts, please! Never felt like that? That's the thing that hurts. We've got to look at it. We don't want to hear uncomfortable things. We don't want to have them pointed out to us. We don't have to confront uncomfortable truth. <clears throat> I... Um, Saw some stats recently from an organization called Open Doors. They live in some Soviet work in America. Open Doors represents the persecuted church. Tries to get people to pray and so on. And they did this, this particular survey and it demonstrated a huge reluctance on the part of US pastors to report on and encourage prayer for the persecuted church. And the reason, that they did some work on the reason, the reason was they felt under such compulsion to present only positive messages. Can you believe that? We live in a world that requires of us that we only present uncontentious, undisturbing things. And Habakkuk here complains that his nose, as it were, is being pushed up hard at the glass of the window he has on the injustice and the wrongdoing in his society. And he would very much prefer not to have to look through that window. I can understand that. I can understand that there are times when we have to look at things and we just need a break from it. And Habakkuk has a burden on his shoulders because he isn't being afforded that luxury. That's the weight on it. 
being soothed about sin in our society certainly isn't the reason that he's in the God business. It certainly isn't for us. So what is Habakkuk getting disturbed by? The obvious problems. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? There's more to it. There are these couplets, these three couplets of things that he's considering in his world that are troubling him. Now, okay, trouble and suffering, plunging in violence, strife and contention, violence. We've got loads of that about them, we shove their own noses, we've got to look at whether it's television violence, games, violence, media, reporting on violence, it's all violence. Films, video games, hosts of other media. They shape the attitudes of the people we live with and live amongst, and you get back what you put in. Violence. It's nothing new. Uh, biblically, this problem of societal violence goes back to the days long before Noah learned navigation. It's one of the reasons for the flood in Genesis 6, the violence in the land. It's been growing since Cain slew Abel. But now a most unusual situation prevails in which those set apart to be God's particular people around Habakkuk, they are engaging in violence amongst themselves. And it's because they've violated the stipulations of God's covenant that they're now going to have to live through the curses promised in that ancient covenant on those who break that covenant. You'll be unsuccessful in everything you do. Day after day you'll be oppressed and robbed with no one to rescue you. It's in Deuteronomy 28, 29. What do you expect? It's there in the book. What do you expect, Habakkuk? So the couplets here, these three couplets, spell out the specifics of the situation. Trouble and suffering. Do you remember Balaam called upon to curse Israel by a foreign king? He describes the blessings that God had placed on Israel by saying he could find no, Aven is the word, misfortune, no trouble. And he could find no Amal, suffering in Israel, trouble and suffering. He couldn't see them in Israel because the blessing of God was on those people. And now here's Habakkuk saying those things are not there. <coughs> the things that Balaam noticed as being, you know, particular blessings on the people of Israel. And that God was with them and he couldn't curse them. You know, here we are. Those things are gone. Sin and its full orb consequence now prevails throughout the land. And in that situation, Habakkuk observes... A serious consequence. Sin leads to lawlessness. Therefore the law is paralyzed, justice never prevails. The wicked heaven, the righteous, and the justice is perverted. In their situation, having the law does Judah absolutely no good at all. They've gone to the point where the truth doesn't help them anymore. It's a bad place to be, isn't it? Seldom, but sometimes been called in towards the end of somebody's perhaps human life, maybe into a hospital by a family member or whatever. And they've gone on so long in rebellion against God, the truth can't help them anymore. God's law is numbed by these people's drift into sin. The Hebrew word is pug, and it's a good word, pug. So it's a woody word. Uh, and that word refers to, you know, when you. When you go home and you get your stuff out of the deep freeze and you spend too long fiddling around with the stuff in the deep freeze, you know what happens to the ends of your fingers? Yeah? The effect of cold on the ends of your fingers is to numb them, isn't it? And they get numbed and they can't work anymore. They don't, they don't have any effect because they've gone all cold. Yeah? Or when you're on your bike. Remember those days? When you're on your bike, yeah, I know, me too. You're riding along and some days you get an hour and a half in the cold in the winter and you cannot put the brakes on <laughs> because your fingers are gone. Yeah? It's that. That's what we're looking at here. The effect of extreme cold on the sensitivity of touch, the functionality of the fingers, the law is numb. 
due to sensitivity that God's law has been degraded by the sin that she's run into and embraced. It's not that she's abandoned the law. <clears throat> it's that the sin has driven the law away. So here's the nub of Habakkuk's first complaint. Bear in mind, he's going to come back with another. <laughs> he can find no justice amongst God's own people. He can find no justice amongst God's own people. And when we come across situations amongst God's own people and we find it hard, we need to remember that is nothing new. God's only got sinners to be working with, right? He can find no justice there. Don't I have to listen here in Wales to the same sorts of things regularly that Habakkuk is complaining about? I do. Rather than what he ought to be seeing, Habakkuk sees a a brutal perversion of God's law prevailing throughout the land. Don't we see that around us? And don't we see the effect of it in the conduct that takes place yeah. between people in even religious institutions? Sin has been chosen and the law has been none, but the effect is evident. And the people committed to following the Lord in the way and putting their lives on the line for Him and His word are suffering abuse, endless abuse, and they cry out, how long? And they're crying out, why? And the prayers of the faithful, God heard, and his law seems none by having spiritually frozen hands laid on it. And guys like Habakkuk are crying out, how long? Why? And if that's not a pretty fair description of Wales today, I don't know what is. Because things are not as good as they appear. When you get beneath the surface. How does God explain this dreadful situation? His failure to charge in and sort it out? Well, that'll be next week's thrilling installment. Hey, don't keep people coming back, man, do you know? It's, it's got to be done. <laughs> Check it out between now and next week, eh? Verse 5, there's this warning. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. Fasten your seatbelt, Habakkuk. You ain't going to believe this. I know this is God. And I am going to do something about it. I'm going to do something in your days you wouldn't believe, even if you were told. By the way, it's God telling him. Huh? I'm going to raise up the Babylonians. You better watch out. They're going to come flying through here, and these people are going to learn they shouldn't mess with God. They insisted on this king, and look where it's got them. And this unexpected instrument of my corrective, corrective justice. My righting the wrongs you're crying out about, I'm going to do it. You've cried out, I'm now going to do it, watch. The unexpected instrument is this small people of Babylonians who suddenly rise to great power. And they, can't, they really surge up on the scene, and they, they come to dominate from Egypt, right back to the lake. They dominate right across that part of the, the ancient world. Huge. And do you know what? They're gone again pretty quickly. Secular historians comment on the sudden rise and decay of the Babylonians. Well, there's the warning, there's the unexpected instrument, and then this detailed description, 20 explicit details or so, of the coming force of divine judgment and retribution for the sin that Habakkuk was crying out about. Yeah, you wanted something done, I have a it's going to be done, boy. It's going to get done. We'll have to start with it next week. This has been troubling enough already. For the moment, please notice this. God is not ever doing nothing. God is not ever doing nothing. He may be doing something we can aspire and look forward to. That is a possibility. Of course it is. He may be doing something he's perfectly right to do, but we hope he never would. He may be doing something we don't want to hear about, because knowing about it too far in advance is frankly going to scare the pants off us. But he's never doing nothing. He is always doing something. And whatever it is that he's doing, the just shall always live by. What's happened here is that Habakkuk has poured out 
a bitter complaint to God about the duration and the apparent lack of purpose that underlies the awful effects he sees in his world of the sinful rebelliousness of God's people in his time. He could have got there by reflecting on what he knew from the Bible already, but that isn't working. Often it doesn't. He's getting there only by meeting with his God. By relating to his God. God's people, you understand, not the nations. Not the nations, but God's people who have simply adopted the ways of the nations in place of the ways of God, taught in his word. They are the ones that he's crying out about. Not the pagans. Habakkuk has set out on his journey with God over this vexed issue. And sometimes we have vexed issues and we're on a journey with God about those things. That's, that's the way it is. I don't know how long that's going to be. But he's on this journey about why God allows departure from his truth, injustice and violence to prevail. And God's response hasn't been what Habakkuk anticipated. Habakkuk, I'm listening, look, I'm here. This is what it's going to be. It's going to be hard to take. It's going to call for far more investment in faith. But through it, the just will live by faith. An awesome divine response to the trouble that Habakkuk sees hovers on the horizon of history. And as God sees the problem even more profoundly, even more seriously than this highly perplexed prophet, the solution is going to be drastic. It seems overwhelming. But the underlying message of the book is this. A mature in faith trusts perseveringly in God's ways of establishing justice and righteousness on earth. And he's sending a king. He's sending a king who's going to reign in justice and righteousness and peace. The very things that Habakkuk says in this scene in his own time. And Habakkuk wrestles with the burden of submitting to an entirely new idea of the Lord's purposes among Israel and the nations. And we may wrestle with God's entirely new idea. What's ahead of us? God is interacting with his people. He's leading his people forward in ways that are utterly contrary to anything they've come previously to expect. And the challenge in all of that is for the righteous to continue to live by faith through that change. Tell me that's not a challenge we're also facing, given what's happening in our society, in our world. Recently, on Twitter, one of our big famous atheist comedians was ranting about some teacher who had had the temerity to allow children in her school to receive the gift of little booklets about uh, creation. She should be fired out of there and express it in more vivid language than I care to convey, right? But, um, you yeah, know, ranting about that. That's the world we're in. Things are changing. And through these days, although our soul cries out, the just shall live by.